If folks could take their seats, we will go ahead and get started. Well, welcome everyone. It's great to see all of you and thanks for coming on this still snow-covered day. Uh, as a reminder, this is the second of six seminars uh, that we are having in a series that's commemorating the launch of the Human Genome Project 25 years ago. Um, you may recall that back in December, um, we had um, a panel discussion consisting of NHGRI leaders and their perspectives on uh, the formulation and execution of the Human Genome Project. But the next five speakers in this series, which I have listed here, are going to be given by active participants of the Human Genome Project. Now, most of the remaining speakers were, like me, um, sort of scientific toddlers at the time of the launch of the Human Genome Project. But today is going to be an exception because the speaker today was uh, already a scientific icon uh, when the Human Genome Project launched. And so it's, it's really with great pleasure that I'm going to start today's session by introducing our speaker, uh, Dr. Maynard Olson. Now the risk, I will tell you, of having me do this is that my verbal accolades uh, about him could probably go on longer than his seminar. And while this is incredibly tempting, I can tell you, um, I won't let that happen, I promise, but I do have a lot to say, so bear with me. Um, let me start with some biographical details. So Maynard received his BS in chemistry from Caltech and his PhD in inorganic chemistry from Stanford doing his thesis work in the laboratory of Nobel laureate Henry Taub, after which he joined the faculty of Dartmouth College, where, among other things, he taught undergraduate chemistry. But as a chemist, Maynard um, became increasingly interested in DNA as an information molecule and sought a greater connection with biological research. Um, in particular, he became interested in genetics. And so he uprooted himself from Dartmouth and pursued um, additional research training in yeast genetics in Ben Hall's lab at the University of Washington in Seattle. Now his work on yeast tRNA genes, uh, which included studying their position in the yeast genome, um, in many ways served as a foundation for his long-term interest um, in genome structure. Well, in 1979, uh, Maynard uh, took his, uh, an assistant professorship at Washington University in St. Louis, and then in meteoric type fashion, um, he simply, well, he's just, he became famous, is what I could say, for reasons I'm going to describe shortly. Um, in 1992, uh, he actually moved from Washington University in St. Louis to the University of Washington in Seattle, where he subsequently finished his own research career and is now a professor emeritus at the university, and as he likes to say, allowing him to do things that he wants to do, such as being here today with all of us. So, Along the way, Maynard has received many well-deserved honors. Um, he was a Howard Hughes Medical Investigator from 89 to 92. He received the Genetic Society of America Medal in 1992, elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1994, awarded the Gardner Foundation International Award in 2002, and then received the Gruber Prize in Genetics in 2007, and that's just naming a few of these honors. And I'm actually very comfortable, as you can tell, describing Maynard's talents and virtues because I was fortunate enough to be his postdoctoral fellow from 1988 to 1992. So by knowing him for the past 28 years, I feel that I can answer the following question. What makes Maynard such a unique researcher, colleague, and mentor? And here is where the list can get really long, uh, but I'm going to limit myself to three observations. First, Maynard is remarkably innovative. Um, he sees the research landscape with greater acuity than anyone else I know and has the tenacity to pursue scientific endeavors regardless of their popularity or their difficulty. Now, shown here is precisely that brilliant tenacity, and actually I know because I saw his slides, you're going to see this slide again for Maynard in his talk. It's an early Maynard figure illustrating a fingerprint mapping paradigm that he developed to construct physical maps of the yeast genome. And shown along the bottom are electrophoretically separated restriction fragments from individual phage clones, each containing a segment of the yeast genome, and Maynard reduced the practice of the ability to use such data to, of clone -based, to construct clone-based physical maps of yeast DNA, and in short, those fragments can be used in a very analytical way to deduce the order across linear DNA, such as the yeast genome. And what's important is that this paradigm laid the groundwork for efforts in the Human Genome Project to build maps of the human genome prior to the eventual sequencing of the human genome. Now, a second of Maynard's attributes that I feel particularly passionate about is that he's nothing short of a spectacular mentor. Uh, 
Now, shown here um, are, are the two of us in the middle of my postdoctoral fellowship. And over several decades, I was fortunate enough to be one of many talented postdocs and graduate students that passed through his laboratory. Actually, I know some are in this audience. Um, and with his very hands-off style, Maynard mentored these trainees by subtly guiding them to fertile areas and then effectively orchestrating their success. And he, he always served as a prototypic role model by demonstrating the highest standards of integrity and collegiality. In addition, he was incredibly generous. And I've witnessed this time in, uh, time, and many, many times where he would, including for me, see that the projects started by his trainees, in particular his postdocs, would just be given to those postdocs to then help launch their own independent research careers. But I want to really stress from these first two things, don't let his professional appearance fool you. Um, Maynard is actually quite fun. Um, he's actually a joy to talk to about almost any topic, especially when you get a beer in his hand, as shown here. And this photo was actually captured, uh, uh, Maynard at a particularly festive mood at an earlier NHGRI event, uh, standing actually with Val Maduro, um, who's actually started in Maynard's lab in the mid-1980s making yeast media for his lab when she was an undergraduate at Washington University. And I don't know if she's in the audience now, but Val has been a technician at NHGRI for almost 21 years now, um, including many years in my own laboratory, and now associated with the Undiagnosed Diseases Program. Well, third and finally, um, Maynard is the consummate scientific leader. He is a true legend. His vision for research opportunities is insightful and inspirational. Um, some scientists influence a project, uh, some influence an area. Maynard has been instrumental in transforming a field, and that is the field of genomics. Starting with those crazy restriction maps of yeast DNA, he recognized the value of obtaining detailed knowledge of whole genomes in the form of maps and later sequence. And I can't overstate the key role that he played in developing the strategic blueprint for the Human Genome Project and providing sage advice throughout the entire project and beyond, actually. And I'll also be candid in telling you that his ideas, well, let's just say they're not always popular. Um, indeed, he is often a lightning rod for debate, advocating positions that go against the common grain. However, eliciting some disagreement is actually a sign of great leadership, uh, because more often than not, you know, he's actually turned out to be right and just simply two steps ahead of the rest of us. Now, meanwhile, he shies away from the spotlight, and he's not necessarily the one that most gets featured for the success of the Human Genome Project, but anyone in the know will tell you about the central role he's played as an international leader for the project and for the field of genomics more broadly. And so it's obviously, as you can tell, with great pleasure that I introduce a personal hero of mine, Dr. Maynard Olson, who's going to talk about genomics grows up, what have we learned during the past 25 years? Maynard. Well, that's a difficult introduction to follow, uh, but fortunately I have at least a kind of a humorous Maynard first slide. Uh, I'm spending the, uh, the winter term in Ojai, California, which is uh, in the mountains north of Los Angeles. And when I was starting to prepare this talk, uh, literally three days ago, I went out for a walk in my neighborhood and took the picture on the left. Uh, that's the Topa Topa Mountains at uh, sunset and uh, came back and checked on, on conditions in Bethesda. And uh, so this slide is a uh, sign of my loyalty to the NHGRI, uh, the NIH, and uh, your programs, because uh, I'm here. Still like that today <laughs> in uh, Ojai. So uh, I found it challenging to sort of decide how to take up this mandate. Uh, what, what have we learned uh, during the past 25 years? And I really, uh, that gets us back to the launching of the Human Genome Project. Uh, and uh, 40 years is probably closer to my time trajectory in, in genomics. The, you know, the, the uh, term genomics was only coined in the late 1980s, uh, but uh, like everything, it had a prehistory. What I decided to do uh, is to go through a uh, highly selective, very uh, light 
uh, version of kind of my trajectory through genomics and to intersperse as I go along uh, what I think some of the big picture lessons are. Uh, some of the lessons uh, uh, relate to sort of how technology development works in a, in a complex area like genome analysis. Uh, that was always a major focus of mine. Uh, some of them relate to uh, really science policy issues, kind of what policies kind of work and which ones not so well. Uh, the policy thread I'm going to try to project, it's the one thing I'm going to try to project into the future if I uh, get that far. Uh, and there'll be a actual scientific lesson or two, that is uh, uh, things that uh, we've learned kind of about biology uh, through all of this activity. So that's the plan. Uh, Eric mentioned that uh, when I was uh, making my transition from chemistry to, uh, to genetics in Ben Hall's lab, I worked on uh, transfer RNA genes. And uh, the main lesson here, <coughs> I'll actually say in advance of just describing the project a little bit. Uh, is that uh, this was sort of a perfect project for me uh, in that uh, you didn't need to know much biology, which I, I didn't. Uh, and uh, it came with a sort of a pre-built-in genomic view, uh, which is captured really by this map. This is a, uh, a yeast genetic map of uh, vintage early 70s when this work was going on circled our uh, eight uh, essentially unlinked loci that uh, were known to encode uh, tyrosine inserting uh, nonsense suppressors. That is uh, their genetic phenotypes where they suppress nonsense mutations. You can isolate them uh, as amber, ochre, or umber uh, suppressing alleles. Uh, and uh, enough biochemical genetics had been done to show that they inserted tyrosine at the positions of nonsense mutations. So we assumed that they were uh, tyrosine tRNA genes. Uh, but the genetic mapping here uh, really stuck with me. This had been done uh, over decades. And uh, this genetic map actually would still look rather good today. Uh, there are 17 centromere uh, uh, linked linkage groups. And you can see the very bottom one has dotted lines connecting the arms to the centromeres. That turns out to be the only serious mistake in this map is that that chromosome doesn't exist. Uh, those arms map elsewhere. Uh, the other 16 centromere link linkage groups are the 16 chromosomes of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. All of that uh, rather nicely pulled together uh, using the awesome power of yeast genetics as it's sometimes described. Uh, so I started with a kind of genomic view. I was going to try to study some genes that were scattered all over the genome, and I had a rather good overview uh, of uh, kind of where they were, how they were arranged. Uh, the genetics were outstanding. And uh, so for people uh, unfamiliar with yeast genetics, the, the vertical columns of uh, four colonies here are four haploid progeny of a uh, single meiotic event something you can do in yeast, so-called tetrad analysis. Uh, over to the left, we see the diploid phenotypes. Uh, at the bottom is wild type. Uh, so this is being done in a background that had a red colony color uh, marker that was uh, suppressible, nonsense suppressible. Uh, a homozygous uh, suppressor is the white phenotype, the full suppression of the uh, red colony color phenotype. Uh, the pink is the heterozygous uh, diploid, uh, and uh, it gives an intermediate phenotype. But of course, when you segregate the haploid segregants, uh, you get uh, uh, two uh, fully suppressed and two unsuppressed. This is Mendelian genetics. So uh, because my background was in chemistry and I uh, was kind of taking this uh, beginner's view of the situation, uh, I, uh, I had a rather textbook attitude toward this project, which uh, uh, proved helpful in this instance. Uh, we had Mendelian genetics, and uh, we had uh, yeast DNA, 
and uh, there was really no tie-in uh, between these two worlds. The genetic world very well developed uh, even then. Uh, with respect to yeast DNA, uh, the only thing we knew how to do was to extract it, cut it with EcoR1, and run it on an agarose gel. This was our only experiment. Uh, but I found this allowed me to really focus. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I still remember my excitement when I first saw uh, gels like this. Because uh, if you look at this, uh, you know, there's structure. Uh, the brighter bands at the bottom are uh, uh, repeated segments from the uh, ribosomal DNA clusters, but the rest uh, are just kind of what you would calculate on the back of an envelope for statistical fluctuations in the size distribution of uh, equal or one fragments, assuming that the sites were randomly distributed across the genome. The, you know, I've uh, made in the past the, you know, the sort of comparison that may seem odd to a biologist but was natural to a, a physical chemist is that uh, it reminded me of reading of uh, John Kendrew's description of the first time that he saw an X-ray diffraction pattern of uh, hemoglobin. It's that uh, this was 25 years before the hemoglobin structure was solved, uh, but you know, he could see that the you know, that the atoms were all in the same place in every molecule in the crystal. Uh, he just had no idea how to find out where they were. So I looked at this and said, uh, well, uh, something that any geneticist would have taken for granted. I said, well, uh, the equal one sites are in the same place in every copy of the genome. Otherwise, you wouldn't get a pattern like this. And there ought to be some way of uh, figuring out where they are. Uh, so. Sometimes it's an advantage to be a beginner. That's one uh, lesson. And uh, I suppose the policy lesson there is that we, we should keep an on-ramp uh, in genomics and, for that matter, every other field. Uh, science gets more and more specialized as it goes along. Beginners always are at obvious disadvantages. In any given lab, it's almost always better you know, to hire somebody with more experience. Uh, but fields uh, require uh, influx. And you know, I think it's clear that even the most casual reading of the history of molecular biology is probably one of the strongest bits of support for that uh, in the whole history of science. Well, somewhere in there, I assumed that there were uh, eight EcoR1 fragments that had uh, tyrosine tRNA genes on them. And uh, fortunately, uh, Ed Southern developed uh, gel transfer hybridization. Uh, between the time when the previous slide was taken and uh, this one, we were working from a mimeographed uh, protocol. And uh, so I, uh, you know, I could isolate uh, tyrosine tRNA and uh, label it with uh, iodine 125 and do gel transfer hybridization. And wow, there were eight bands, uh, the, uh, which I labeled A through H. And uh, over on the right, could show that they were uh, competed away by uh, purified, uh, unlabeled tyrosine tRNA. And, uh, it's the only experiment we knew how to do. But uh, the, the, the uh, presupposition was that uh, if we were lucky, uh, these eight equal R1 fragments corresponded to those eight genetic loci. And so the next question in this sort of beginner's approach uh, was to figure out which of these corresponded to which of the genetic loci. And we didn't know how to do that. Uh, one uh, observation early on was that uh, the, these eight fragment patterns, you can see we gradually got better at doing our one experiment. That's, that's what comes from really focusing. Uh, we're not always in the same place in uh, different strains. And uh, so that uh, suggested uh, the possibility of using these variants, I assume that they were just missing uh, or extra equal one sites in one strain relative to the other, uh, that they could be used as genetic markers and look at, uh, we could look at co-segregation with the phenotypes. And so this just shows one tetrad, the, uh, the variant that's uh, <coughs> the marked uh, with the yellow arrow is, uh, uh, appears unlinked in this one tetrad to uh, the colony color phenotype and uh, 
the one with the red, uh, Costa segregates uh, with it, and uh, the, from this one tetrad, one would infer that the, the red arrow points to uh, the variant that's present in the wild type strain, and the, the one labeled with the black arrow to the one in the suppressor strain. Well, we did a few more tetrads. Uh, the LOD score was not impressive, but uh, convincing enough to push ahead with our best case. Uh, the previous slide was actually from a 1979 paper, uh, at which point we had uh, correctly, as it turns out, identified all eight of the, the fragments. And, uh, but uh, two years earlier, collaborating with uh, Howard Goodman, uh, uh, I had taken the, uh, my best case, SUP4 locus, and uh, managed to clone uh, using technology that I was taught by Ron, Ron Davis. Uh, to uh, clone both the wild type and mutant alleles and uh, to sequence them. And uh, so we learned almost nothing uh, new uh, from this project, but uh, you can see that there's a kind of uh, a closing of the circle. It's very appealing. Uh, it was very appealing to me uh, with my uh, beginner's view of biology. Uh, the, the mutant. Uh, contained the expected change in the anticodon for ochre-suppressing uh, tyrosine tRNA on this. I believe uh, it was, was the first sequence of a uh, mutant eukaryotic gene. Uh, sort of closed a kind of uh, epical uh, story, which uh, began with uh, Mendel and uh, continues uh, today. But uh, Although bacterial genetics clearly had been integrated with molecular genetics uh, earlier, it was really in yeast that, uh, that Mendelian genetics became integrated with uh, molecular genetics. So to put the sequencing in perspective, uh, which clearly is a kind of central issue for the Human Genome Project, uh, up until around 2002, the uh, NCBI used to, used to indicate the, just the total number of base pairs present in GenBank. They, they don't do it anymore because it's no longer a meaningful measurement. Uh, most, of the, most of the data in GenBank is resequencing of various things and so forth. Uh, but this, uh, up to this point, gives some idea of just the growth of sequencing as an activity. And so I'm going to come back in, uh, in a moment to uh, this NRC report and the kind of the early days of the Human Genome Project, but our, our little 100 base pair sequence is sort of out here. Uh, so there was a long period uh, in which sequencing was in the baseline in a, any plot relevant to, uh, to the uh, idea of sequencing the human genome. And I'm going to also have some comments about uh, you know, what was going on during this long lag phase. Uh, were there technical reasons or was it just policy obstacles that <clears throat> prevented moving this exponential phase uh, <clears throat> a decade or more to the left. So Eric already showed this slide. Uh, the, uh, the next step for us with the tRNA genes was uh, now we sort of locally correlated equal one fragments with, uh, with uh, genetic uh, loci. Uh, but clearly uh, the next step was to try to do this globally, that is to have a physical map for yeast and to correlate it with the genetic map. And uh, for reasons I think I will not elaborate upon, uh, I settled on the, this uh, clone fingerprinting strategy. Uh, I think the lesson I'll extract from this is that you always need to have some confidence, uh, a certain recklessness is essential in all research, but some confidence that uh, things are going to get better. Uh, you know, research problems uh, get stuck in a lot of ways. Uh, and uh, a key point really about genomics, and certainly was a key point in my career, is that the, the overall technology base of the society was changing uh, dramatically year by year uh, during this whole period. And if, if that hadn't, we were riding a tidal wave of technological change. And uh, without that technological change, in, in retrospect, our initial goals would have been utterly futile. So the, the aspect of uh, this slide that I'll just uh, emphasize that point with is that I, I, I drew this slide. This is a negative, first of all. Uh, we're talking film here. 
Uh, but uh, more interesting is what it's a negative of, is that I, I, I drew this schematic with a Leroy lettering set. Now, only some of the older people here are going to know what a Leroy lettering set is, but it's a device that uh, has an India ink pen guided by a template on a T-square. And on onion skin paper, you can sort of uh, letter things like this. It was actually the best available technology uh, in about 1979 or so when I was drawing this slide. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we had, had these uh, great plans that involved a lot of computer analysis and so forth. Uh, there were computers, of course, but uh, there was no distributed computing. Uh, they were uh, centralized uh, uh, devices which uh, had uh, less processing power than uh, Christmas card has today. Uh, so uh, we were dependent in ways that we could not really appreciate on this tidal wave of technological change. And I emphasize this because uh, we need to maintain the same confidence today. Uh, the uh, tendency is at any stage, particularly act af after a stage of dramatic technological change, to think that you're on some sort of plateau and that uh, things are only going to get better in some kind of uh, local and uh, more or less predictable ways. Uh, you know, an uh, iPhone is going to have a lot more apps and, uh, you know, they'll do a lot more of the same sorts of things, most of which we don't need to have done anyway. Uh, technology development really uh, doesn't follow that course and uh, uh, it follows rather unpredictable courses. And of course, I'd be extremely wealthy today uh, if I had had even a glimpse of the trajectory on which technology was going to develop from this uh, standpoint. I knew enough not to invest in the Leroy Lettering Company, but uh, <laughs> didn't know uh, where to put my bets. We don't know that today, but I believe that the challenges that we face in genomics today are going to require dramatically new technology. And uh, if we try to guess exactly what that technology is, we will surely get it wrong. Uh, so this is just uh, shows that we could collect real data. <coughs> and uh, gradually it started to work. Uh, the c c uh, calculations here were done on a mini computer, a VAX, uh, for those of you from that era. Programs were written in Fortran. But the basic idea worked that uh, we would uh, uh, Basically, uh, the, the notion behind uh, much of genomics is that you try to make the experimental work linear. Uh, if you're going to do a genome that's twice as big or you're going to do it with quite twice the depth, that you, you, you do only twice as much experimental work, picking more clones or molecules or whatever. And the, the irreducible sort of n squared aspect of the problem uh, you do in a computer. And, uh, so by now, I actually had a, had a, a printer that uh, this, this map was done with a printer, although I still use my Leroy lettering set to, uh, to put in some correlation with the uh, genetic map. Uh, and uh, genetics has had a collegial uh, kind of uh, character to it, not uh, unblemished by uh, occasional disruptions. But uh, it has had one, and uh, we should sort of try to cling to that. I don't know quite how. Uh, early genomics uh, grew out of the model organism communities. I think that's a point that's very important lesson, is that uh, the initiative to do genomics did not come from human genetics. There was actually considerable resistance uh, to the idea of doing genomics. It's a little hard to recapture the reasons for that, but there was if anything, resistance. Uh, essentially, none of the innovation uh, came from the human genetics community. Uh, it came from model organisms. And I think uh, the important point about model organisms, uh, there are several important points. Uh, one of them is that they do tend to favor this kind of holism. Uh, to try to look, you know, the, the yeast community is interested in yeast. The worm community interested in the worm. And uh, to a degree, uh, people in these communities uh, have to be and are interested in the, in the whole picture. Not, uh, they're not as hyper-specialized as people become uh, in uh, organisms where it's simply impossible to look at the whole picture, uh, like the mouse or the human. Uh, 
is uh, the complexity is simply too great, particularly the human. Uh, there also is an extremely important sort of cultural tradition that goes back to Delbruck in the early days of molecular biology that, uh, you know, there, sure, there's lots of competition in model organism uh, work, uh, but uh, at least historically, uh, there were complex sort of rules of engagement uh, that favored uh, openness and uh, this collegiality. So this is an example, is that uh, uh, these two papers uh, were published back to back in the PNES. They were the sort of my first really comprehensive report about the uh, yeast genome mapping project. And this is from uh, John Selston, Alan Colson, and colleagues uh, about the worm uh, map. Uh, uh, Sidney Brenner, who was involved in the worm project, uh, uh, su suggested this plan for, for publication. We were in, uh, in close communication with one another. And, uh, I think from a policy point of view, uh, we should sort of keep this in mind. Uh, there are kind of three simple models uh, by which uh, competition plays out in, in, in research. Uh, Genomics has experience with all of them, uh, as do most fields. Uh, you know, there's this sort of dog-eat-dog uh, -dog, uh, survival of the fittest uh, competition. Sometimes that's effective. Uh, it's not much fun. Uh, there's this kind of middle road of uh, collegiality uh, that, uh, in which there's productive exchange, but the laboratories really maintain their independent uh, approaches and, uh, and are not in in uh, intense communication. And then there's the more modern uh, favored strategy of big consortia in which uh, there's sort of forced consensus about every issue. My own opinion is that genomics has gone too far in the latter direction uh, and uh, would be wise as it tackles the hardest problems, that is the ones that we don't really know how to do, uh, to, to, uh, to try to work with uh, in this intermediate zone. Uh, and uh, I certainly am appreciative uh, that uh, I was able to spend most of my career in that territory. Uh, there were some technical issues that uh, you know, may seem rather minor, but uh, they, uh, they loomed large and, uh, and did influence, uh, I think, some good advice that uh, that people like John Solston and I, who had experience doing these things, <coughs> uh, communicated to the enthusiasts in the early days of the Human Genome Project, is that uh, anyone who does this, this is just as true today as it, as it was then, we discovered this uh, very early on the Yeast Project, is that the assembly of the maps was actually limited by the data quality. It was not limited uh, by the ideal computer science N squared kinds of models. Computer scientists uh, have historically taken lots of interest in genomics, and they have made some important contributions. But I think it would be fair to say that, the, that, that computer science as a field has historically uh, uh, over-idealized the problems. And uh, the computer science works on idealized models and uh, has uh, enormous experience, you know, sorting lists of random numbers and so forth by the most efficient strategy with the sort of least likelihood of ending up in some worst case scenario and so forth. Uh, actually, none of that theory. I interacted with some really top tier computer scientists over this project and I learned a lot from them. But one thing I learned uh, is that we had to solve these problems ourselves. Uh, because the kind of worst case analysis that uh, characterizes uh, computer science and computational complexity uh, is, uh, simply put, the worst cases that they worry about never occur in genomics because long before then uh, you get tangled up in data that haven't been filtered adequately and where you're not handling non-idealizations. This happens every time, whereas the kind of problems that they tend to worry about are, uh, are too rare uh, to be applicable. And uh, we keep relearning this problem, uh, and uh, we will keep learning it. But uh, I think more could be done in this area uh, of uh, trying to deal formally uh, 
with the assembly of enormous data sets that on the surface of it are governed by simple logical models, but in the reality uh, have uh, problems that are difficult uh, to filter out, and filtering out is not even always the right approach. So at this stage, uh, you know, the East project was working, and it still <coughs> went on for a while to close gaps, increase continuity, and so forth. But uh, we wanted to work on uh, larger genomes. And uh, so one thing that was apparent to me, a lot of the early proposals uh, for doing uh, human genomics were cosmic-based. It's the best available uh, technology of the day. And you know, the worm and yeast projects were all done with cosmid and cosmids and lambda, at least in their early phases. <coughs> and uh, I think that uh, we all knew uh, that it just wasn't going to work. For a whole list of reasons, it just wasn't going to work to, uh, to analyze uh, mammalian genomes with those vectors. It would be extremely difficult today uh, with a lot more experience in the, the recombinant DNA technology uh, to anal do a de novo analysis of a mammalian genome using Fosman vectors, for example. Uh, so there was interest in trying to make uh, vectors with larger inserts, and uh, I'm not going to talk in any detail about the YAC story, but uh, uh, David Burke and George Carl were two uh, graduate students in my lab, and actually as a side project, they both had uh, primary projects in the lab, uh, but as a side project, they, uh, they got uh, sort of a YAC vector system working in which we could clone these relatively large inserts, uh, hundreds of thousands of base pairs uh, with, I would describe, moderate success. So in parallel with this, uh, there was starting to be some real interest in genomics. It was not until the uh, the later 1980s, uh, that uh, that genomics, uh, the, t the term was was uh, coined, and uh, and interest began to broaden and intensify. One of the reasons that Sidney Brenner kind of pushed pushed us to publish uh, in 1986 is that he could see that that was that was going to happen, and you know the field started to need to have some papers to point to with data in them as opposed to uh, talk. It was a lot of talk. Uh, I did start to spend a little more of my time then on policy issues, and you know, there I have mixed feelings about that. I think any any scientist does uh, that. Uh, you know, it's a zero sum game, and uh, I don't have regrets about having been as engaged as I was in uh, policy. There were certainly people that were more engaged, <laughs> but uh, it's a choice I made, and. Uh, I would encourage kind of younger science, scientists today to, uh, you know, to get involved in policy issues. Uh, I, uh, as you know, the junior member of, of this committee, the Alberts Committee, in 1988, uh, I, uh, I learned an enormous amount, and I think I did contribute something. And I think that's my message to younger scientists, is that you know, they, have, they have a whole set of different points of view. Uh, they almost always have more experience, real experience, hands-on. Uh, Shirley Tillman was the only other member of this really august committee. I mean, this was Brenner and Watson and Botstein and Hood and so forth. Uh, but uh, Shirley and I were really the only ones that had ever sequenced anything and uh, had any real idea what the issues were uh, at that level. And, uh, and that's not the only kind of level that needs attention, but we should never neglect it. We need, uh, we need young scientists. And they are doing it at some expense to their career, and uh, that's, a, that's a choice they need to make, but we hope that some of them will be willing to. Uh, one lesson from the, this, this, uh, this report is, uh, is a policy one. <coughs> and uh, the, uh, this report is uh, remarkably free of hype. Read this today. And, uh, this is about as far as we went in the executive summary. So we said that uh, it would increased understanding of the genome would greatly enhance progress in human biology and medicine. Uh, this argument actually sold extremely well. I really believe that there is a fundamental misapprehension uh, in, uh, in science policy circles that uh, 
that the only thing that sells is hype. Uh, I've dealt with a lot of, I, a lot of politicians. Uh, my policy hat uh, testified three times in front of Congress about the Human Genome Project. And, uh, you know, you can say whatever you like about uh, politicians. We all like to say things about politicians. <clears throat> but uh, they're uh, mostly <clears throat> pretty smart. And uh, they have very strong bullshit detectors. <laughs> they, they, they are in, inundated <laughs> with, uh, you know, with statements that can't be taken seriously. That's not just in the current presidential uh, campaign. It's, uh, <laughs> this is politics. Uh, occasionally has more colorful manifestations than others, but uh, the politicians are actually quite good at seeing through this. And, uh, and they appreciate, actually, a message that uh, makes sense to them. Uh, that was my consistent experience in the Human Genome Project, and I believe today we continue uh, to oversell things uh, in ways that distort uh, the, the essential nature of what we're attempting to accomplish and uh, don't actually help sell it. Well, the task now uh, was to uh, pull together uh, some kind of a parallel with the Yeast Project in the late days of the Yeast Project to to try to do uh, similar things in, uh, in the human genome. And, uh, of course, need a good postdoc. You've already seen a better version of this, uh, this picture, but uh, I was fortunate to find the perfect postdoc to uh, kind of help us steer into this new world. Uh, we knew that just uh, scaling up what we were doing in yeast just wasn't going to work for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, we needed bigger inserts, but we also needed different ways of dealing with them. That, uh, and uh, the PCR was kind of the new kid on the block, technically. An amazing thing about the uh, NRC Human Genome Report published in 1988 is it does not mention PCR or any variant thereof. It's a recombinant DNA kind of view of the world. And uh, you know, uh, even by 1990, uh, no one in human genetics could even imagine kind of doing anything uh, without relying on PCR. But uh, the, the very first paper, uh, Mollis's first paper in science, had, had been published uh, before the NRC report went to press. And I had read it and uh, frankly found it unconvincing. Sort of an interesting idea, uh, but unconvincing. And uh, you go read it. I think it is unconvincing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, technology, some technologies die, uh, and some of them flourish, PCR flourished. Uh, and uh, we recognized that. Uh, and uh, so PCR uh, assays seem to be the obvious uh, genetic markers <coughs> rather than uh, sizes of restriction fragments. And uh, <coughs> so Eric's project involved... Uh, uh, this kind of synthesis of uh, a screening technology using PCR to find particular uh, loci, uh, particular yaks that contained uh, particular PCR uh, assays, and, uh, and to uh, order the uh, PCR assays and the yaks all at the same time, which is the essence of STS content mapping. Uh, while he was doing, doing this, uh, Anyway, we, oh yeah, we, we you know, worked. We could build maps. So this is kind of the human counterpart of the yeast paper, proof of principle for a, for a uh, what, uh, a couple of million base pairs of uh, human DNA. And uh, so this is 10% the size of the human genome, but you know, this was done in a few months once the, once the uh, oil, once the wheels were oiled. And uh, the, uh, it, uh, it was promising, promising technology. While Eric was doing all the real work here, I uh, was still trying to deal with this kind of policy hat, and uh, I got involved with, uh, you know, you, you need allies. If you're going to influence anybody, you need allies. And uh, so I had some good allies by then, uh, Hood and Cantor and Botstein. Uh, we, we saw it. A, a tremendous need to, uh, first of all, kind of standardize 
not the methods that people were using to map or the clone libraries or the kinds of clones or whatever, but the maps themselves had to be comparable. You had to be able to take a map and compare it. And the maps of that day uh, that were being produced at a, at a rapidly escalating cost really couldn't be compared with one, or, one another at all. Uh, they were tied to a particular clone library and uh, without importing the clone library and essentially repeating the kinds of experiments, there was just uh, no way to integrate uh, them with other maps and so forth. And so that was the gist of the, the SDS idea. And again, you know, I think policy, in my, in my, in my experience, I, I have had a lot of failures in uh, trying to influence policy, but the, the successes uh, have always had a, a simple argument that is easy to state and unembellished, and this was our argument that, uh, you know, that, that this approach should solve the problem of merging data from many sources, eliminate the need for large clone archives, define a physical map that can evolve smoothly toward a sequence, and so forth. You know, you, I think that uh, this is the essence of the policy activity. Uh, we jump uh, too quickly to the politics. And, uh, it, uh, it's actually harder than it looks. Uh, to uh, decide really what you want to do at the right conceptual level. Uh, not too lofty, uh, where it loses touch with reality, and not too detailed, <coughs> where uh, you get lost in the weeds. So there was still a lot of work to be done. Uh, so here we sequenced a, a tRNA gene. Uh, here was the NRC report. Uh, that uh, I think one of the most interesting phases of the Human Genome Project uh, is the period of not quite 10 years after the NRC report issued. Uh, major policy developments were, were gaining momentum then, uh, such as the formation of the National Center for Human Genome Research, the NHGRI's predecessor, and uh, the, uh, you know, the commitment of uh, the federal government to a human genome project, uh, working out of kind of the joint arrangements between the NIH and the DOE and so forth. Uh, so there were policy issues, uh, but there also were technical issues. And uh, I believe there's been a lot of misrepresentation of what was going on uh, during this period, uh, that uh, it's easy from a standpoint of, let's say, around 2000 or 1998 uh, to say that there was just a lot of waste of time in here, committee meetings and so forth. Uh, should have gotten on with it a lot earlier. A story that hasn't yet been written uh, at all, much less well, is what was going on then. So, I mean, Lee Hood was on the, uh, on the uh, NRC committee and uh, had published with uh, Lloyd Smith the four color fluorescence method at, uh, at, at this during the run up period to the NRC report. As we were very well aware, uh, Lee Hood doesn't leave people in doubt about uh, when uh, major technical developments have been made. Uh, but as of the time of the NRC report, it was not even obvious that four color fluorescence was going to be the winner of several technologies. Uh, but more important than that, uh, even for people who guessed correctly uh, that it was going to be the winner, is that it simply didn't work very well. This is a sometimes well-kept secret. The reason that four-color fluorescence took almost a decade uh, to get off the ground, even once commercial uh, instruments were available, is that it just didn't work very well. It could be made to work under really optimum conditions. And but there were several different reasons. And this is a characteristic, I believe, of uh, certainly biological technology. And I suspect that if I knew more about it, uh, one would find this was a rather general characteristic of technology during this refinement phase. Is that uh, there's usually not one problem. You know, if, uh, if getting from where you are to where you want to go has some clear rate limiting step, you know, you need to make the transistors smaller or you need to make the clock run faster or whatever, uh, you know, then you can focus on that and either succeed or not. I have never seen a biological technology that has this characteristic uh, at the refinement stage. 
I mean, at the earlier stage, you know, there are a lot of things that you can either do or not do, and, uh, and doing it means getting it to work once under really optimum conditions. But if you're going to try to make it work as a, as a uh, mainstay technology, uh, there always are a whole bunch of problems, and no one of them is sort of rate limiting in producing a uh, technology that will really work. And so a very short list, there are a lot of other things that could be put on this list, but a very short list, and uh, so pay attention to the dates, uh, 89, 94, 95, 95. The bottom date is misleading because this is a Phil Green uh, paper and you always have to discount his, his publications by about five years in the favorable cases. So this work was done in, you know, in the middle of all this. Uh, the, uh, so cycle sequencing uh, you know, it was a sort of a derivative of PCR. Uh, uh, you go and try with a uh, four-color fluorescence or any other kind of, uh, of, uh, of sequencing instrument other than the single molecule ones and uh, dispense with an amplification step. And uh, yeah, you can do it, but uh, you're not going to sequence the human genome that way. Uh, the, the, the reason that cycle sequencing, you know, sounds obvious, but it's not at all obvious. If you look in detail at the biochemistry of the sequencing reaction, what it says is that the template is, uh, is the limiting reagent in a sequencing reaction. And that turns out to be the case, but uh, there are a lot of KMs and whatnot uh, that influence the fact that that's the case. This says you can reuse, cycle sequencing says you can reuse everything else in the reaction. Uh, but, uh, I mean, they, they have enough of everything else and that you just need to reuse a template uh, to make enough product. Uh, linear polyacrylamide, uh, you know, maybe we could have sequenced the, uh, the uh, human genome using cross-linked uh, polyacrylamide, but uh, it wouldn't have been much fun uh, pouring all those gels. Uh, any kind of automation of the process depended that you have pumpable matrices with single base pair uh, uh, resolution. And, and until the, the 90s, <coughs> it wasn't obvious that that was achievable. Uh, there was certainly no theory uh, telling you that you would ever be able to get single nucleotide resolution. But, uh, energy transfer dyes were a major game changer. Uh, and uh, sort of embedded in this was the shift from uh, labeling the five prime end to the three prime end of sequencing tracks. It's dye terminators. Uh, they had several different effects, which I don't have uh, time to get into now, but the, the most obvious one is that between cycle sequencing and energy transfer dyes, there was a, a dramatic change in the uh, signal and noise considerations and the amount of template that you needed. And uh, the important thing there is not that it's particularly expensive to make a lot of DNA. Uh, it's that you've got to purify it much better. The more, you know, there's a certain amount of junk in a culture uh, that's always going to be there, and you're never going to get rid of it at any feasible cost. And uh, so you don't want to be using very much culture uh, because all that junk's going to be there at the end. Uh, you could do very good four-color fluorescent sequencing before any of these things if you had a half a microgram of highly purified template DNA. Uh, this is not, this doesn't scale. And uh, the mutant DNA polymerases had also very major effects uh, by... Uh, eliminating the, the huge discrimination between uh, natural uh, trinucleotides, uh, uh, triphosphates, and, uh, and the uh, highly decorated ones that were the basis of the fluorescent labeling. And, uh, the, uh, and, and uh, dealing with this ongoing chronic issue that assembly is limited by data quality and that the way that you manage the uh, non-idealities and the data quality is the limiting factor in all assembly methods. Uh, so toward the end of that period, 95, <coughs> really is, it was only then at the con at, at the, uh, as a consequence of this kind of ongoing progress, I finally really got on board with scaling sequencing up. And it's not that my voice was particularly decisive. Uh, but there was a, a real debate, and I obviously was on the side that trying to scale all of this up before about 1995 uh, would have led to unsatisfactory kind of uh, trajectory. I don't think it would have ever converged and uh, would have deferred the kind of work that really needed to be done. Uh, but anyway, I, I started this little science uh, op-ed piece. I, Pointing out that the first time I was ever quoted in science about the Human Genome Project, the quote was a one word. 
I had talked for a half hour or something to this reporter on the phone. And the thing that stuck uh, with her was that I had said it was huge. <laughs> this poem is huge. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, at least now, you know, I was got a, you know, 1,500 words or something to make my case. But uh, yeah, I'm going to basically, for the moment, skip over uh, the key kind of production phase of the Human Genome Project. I was actually not, not much involved in it. There are many people here who know more than I do about uh, kind of the inner workings of that's a different phase of this type of activity and it's not the right person to represent uh, the issues. I am going to come back to the public-private competition, however, because there is a lesson here which I think we haven't yet fully learned and is probably more relevant than ever. I'm going to fast forward to uh, 2011. A lot of things went on uh, in the decade plus. The human genome was uh, to a large degree finished. Uh, it's never really finished, but uh, it's an excellent sequence. Not perfect, but it's excellent. And uh, a lot of that had to do with follow-up efforts uh, after, uh, after those papers were published. Uh, but by 2011, and a lot of comparative genomics were done, uh, many of the, not the field that was pioneered here and uh, <clears throat> became a major activity. Uh, next generation sequencing was, was uh, seriously off the ground. A uh, number of things happened. <clears throat> but in, by 2011, looking back 20 years, it, we'd essentially accomplished the goals that were well-defined in, uh, in uh, 1991. And uh, the question is, is what, uh, what next? Well, of course, there's no sim simple answer to that. There are many things that come next. And uh, I think that, you know, genomics has been served well by a diversified portfolio, even through the production phase. The Genome, Genome uh, Institute uh, supported a uh, uh, moderately diversified portfolio. And uh, fields uh, need a diversified portfolio if they're going to move ahead. Uh, it's the picking winners problem that's well known in the of tech startup world, uh, you uh, better to try a lot of things, fail early and fail often. So I'm not advocating any one path forward, <clears throat> but the one that interests me the most, and uh, is quite the topic uh, these days, Bethesda and elsewhere, is, uh, is what's come to be called precision medicine. It's interesting, I was in China this fall. I've Quite, I know a lot of Chinese scientists and have spent quite a bit of time in China. And uh, they were all talking about precision medicine. And uh, this report is actually is, has been translated into Chinese. And uh, I wrote an introduction to it, which is being translated as we speak into Chinese. There's an intense interest. Take that uh, as a, uh, don't, don't say you weren't told. Uh, the uh, obvious point is that uh, so the international collaboration is critical in genomics. Uh, we've seen that over and over again, and it's critical in all of science. It was certainly critical in genomics. But the reality is that when, uh, when real push really came to shove in the Human Genome Project, uh, there were really only two voices at the table that uh, were largely determinative, the, uh, the NIH and the Wellcome Trust. Uh, they had between them the resources to go ahead on the trajectory that they chose to follow. And uh, other players really had to fall in line. Uh, the future of genomics is simply not going to be like this. It's uh, going to be multilateral. And, uh, and I think the primary risk, actually, in the precision medicine arena is uh, that international collaboration is going to collapse. Uh, even unity within lar the larger countries, including the United States, uh, could easily collapse, and, uh, and you know, we'll learn things, but a highly balkanized effort runs sort of fundamentally counter to the, one of the biggest lessons of genomics, sort of the public trust kind of commons kind of issue, and uh, this is going to be immensely more difficult to achieve in this uh, theater than, uh, than it was, and it wasn't all that easy uh, in, uh, in the Human Genome Project itself. Uh, so this report, I, I was actually involved in getting this off the ground uh, the, uh, <laughs> with uh, David Walt and Alan Williamson. Alan Williamson's been a longtime advisor of the NHGRI. Uh, and I, uh, you know, we're looking for uh, 
we all had a lot of policy experience by then, and we're looking for some kind of way <coughs> to uh, provide some umbrella for the human genotype, phenotype, translational medicine kind of world. And uh, uh, Alan, Will Wilson, uh, Alan Williamson uh, suggested the sort of the new taxonomy is kind of the theme, and that's where this subtitle comes from. Uh, that with his reasonable proposal was that uh, you know the focus should be on uh, you know better diagnosis and uh, more molecularly based uh, kind of uh, classification of diseases, and that other things, good things, then would happen uh, from them. Uh, the committee uh, and and so anyway, the three of us uh, uh, approached uh, the building one and uh, and were pleased with the reception. We got there. There was uh, interest in, in going ahead, and, uh, and, and uh, after some discussion, uh, uh, the idea of uh, having the National Research Council kind of do a lead study in this area was accepted, and it was funded uh, by the director's office. Uh, so I want to say a little bit about uh, my view of the precision medicine challenge. The, uh, we, tried, uh, we tried to follow the, the lesson of of not uh, putting a lot of hype in this report, and this is maybe too long a quote, but uh, it gives the idea, you know, we, there's some things happening. The, uh, you, know, there, you know, everyone who works in the, in the general area that most of us do, uh, you know, has ongoing frustration with uh, the fact that uh, clinical medicine is, you know, is actually burgeoning, and uh, the, uh, there are all kinds of economic and social problems and so forth, but... Uh, the ability to treat patients is improving dramatically on many fronts. Uh, and we're learning immensely more about human biology than we ever thought would be accessible uh, early in the 21st century. Uh, but the frustration has to do with uh, the limited contact points between these two burgeoning worlds. And uh, that's what this report sort of tries to address, is how, uh, how to kind of do better at uh, <coughs> compiling, organizing, manipulating, and extracting true understanding from these kinds of data. Uh, so the, the main, re, uh, the main uh, 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 recommendations are fairly well known, and I will, won't uh, elaborate on them. I'm going to focus on this creation of a open access information commons, uh, which is at the core of it. So this is the, kind of the much worked over figure that uh, kind of the report centers its core recommendations about. And there's this idea that, uh, you know, we're going to have a lot of individual patients and uh, we're going to gather lots of data about them and the data are going to be organized around the patient. So the sort of primary record here is a patient identifier. So let's set aside for this moment uh, you know, the privacy issues and so forth as to how all those things are going to be handled. But uh, the, uh, so everyone kind of nods. That's what we need to do. Uh, but I believe that uh, there is a, a naivete about uh, how achievable this is going to be. I think business as usual will not get us uh, to where this committee kind of pushed. Uh, and just uh, for starters, uh, you know, let me just say that I, I'm unaware if there is a single individual in the world uh, that where I could go and have access to vertically integrated data remotely of this sort uh, that included uh, you know, clinical records, uh, I'm unaware of who this person is. Uh, yeah. And one doesn't create complex systems of this kind in one step overnight, some simple set of policy recommendations. Uh, it has to evolve. I think we know how to make it evolve, uh, but the uh, recipe that's hardest to follow is one that I've tried to illustrate over and over again here, is uh, it takes patience and uh, experimentation. And uh, I'm relatively unconcerned about the information technology issues surrounding this because I'm basically counting on the same rising tide that I counted on through my whole career. Yeah, they're big problems, but uh, those are problems that, uh, you know, tr there are trillions of dollars of investment going into making uh, all that work better, and th th that will, I believe, keep ahead of us. Uh, 
I'm uh, really concerned about the interaction with the uh, individuals. And I will simply express my view that our whole way of enrolling uh, individuals in studies of this type uh, uh, was not designed for this purpose and is not going to be adaptable to this purpose. I'm talking about inf uh, IRBs and uh, uh, tight coupling uh, to, of uh, access to databases to funding from a particular agency, even a big one like the NIH. Uh, I've already mentioned the international issues. Uh, and simply sustainability. Uh, the, Issues that we want to track for these individual patients are not short-term outcomes. We actually know how to study short-term outcomes. We're quite good at doing it. Uh, we don't know, you know how to look at 20-year outcomes, 50-year outcomes. And increasingly, those are going to dominate our whole healthcare system. Is, uh, you know, what should you be doing with a 20-year-old, a 30-year-old, a 40-year-old uh, to decrease particularly morbidity uh, when they're 70 and 80 and 90, which is where you know, we can't afford to do what we're doing now. Well, it takes time to learn about long-term longitudinal effects. And uh, uh, so my uh, kind of uh, policy message is that uh, there was a reason that uh, the Human Genome Project uh, uh, you know, took the period of some decades uh, depending on what starting points and ending points you choose, uh, to be the success that it was. And uh, this is a harder problem. Uh, it is also uh, going to take a substantial period. I won't put a number on it, but a substantial period just to figure out how to do this. And uh, the policy and the politics uh, need to be sort of directed at that goal. Uh, one, uh, just, uh, I'll just call your attention. I won't try to summarize the contents of this, but uh, one minor initiative I got involved in with a number of, a number of other scientists uh, and uh, policy types uh, is looking at, uh, at one alternative model uh, to the way that we currently handle uh, the whole informed consent issues. Uh, I think we're going to need to look at, uh, at many such models. <coughs> so. I, uh, I was going to uh, finish by talking a little bit about uh, kind of what I think the major scientific lessons of the Human Genome Project have been, but I think that's going to have to be for, for another day. Uh, thank you. Absolutely. If people have to go, that's fine, yeah. but there are microphones, and so we will take questions. People just step up to a microphone in one of the two aisles. Maynard, I'm going to bait you. You had some comments you wanted to make about uh, public-private oh, interactions. Yes. You want to maybe summarize high level what you're uh, there? Well, I can refer you to another paper of mine, actually. This is perhaps my most, it's fortunate, fortunately not one of my well-known papers, but it's uh, one of, it is, it is my most controversial paper. It's published in a fairly obscure source that, you know, that most genomicists don't read, the Journal of Molecular Biology. I published it there because uh, it was uh, based on a lecture I gave in the year 2000 at the, in Heidelberg at the European uh, Molecular Biology uh, Institute uh, on a, at a science and society uh, forum. And uh, I, uh, so this was a perspective, uh, the, the, as I say, the, it was published in 2002, but it's a sort of 2000 perspective, which was sort of right in the thick of the production phase of the Human Genome Project. And, uh, uh, so in this in this uh, uh, in this uh, paper, in which uh, I uh, I said what I thought <coughs> about the public-private competition in the Human Genome Project, and uh, it uh, it's probably best to let you read it. Uh, what I uh, I don't think we really learned the lessons uh, from that, uh, and briefly. I, I think that uh, there were major lapses in, uh, in basic standards of scientific behavior, uh, which were uh, o knowingly overlooked uh, because we have a kind of collegial sort of pulling together instinct in science. Uh, but the reason that I wrote down what I thought they were uh, was uh, memories are short and, uh, you know, uh, 
episodes of this kind get respun uh, repeatedly. And I was quite confident we hadn't seen the last of these problems. So that in the precision medicine arena, just briefly, I think uh, uh, one uh, major threat uh, is that even an institution with the resources and political kind of backing uh, that the NIH has uh, risks becoming marginalized relative to the private sector. This is a trillion dollar plus industry just in the United States. You go to China, they're absolutely obsessed uh, with how, uh, you know, how are they going to take care of this you know, expanding middle class in China as they grow old. They don't even have enough children to look after them, all these kinds of issues. Uh, uh, there's intense interest in Europe uh, in, in these issues. And uh, so we're talking, there are trillions of dollars on the table. And if you believe that, uh, if you believe that precision medicine can even have a ma marginal effect, I actually think it long term can do even more than marginal. But let's, suppo let's suppose that it could cut costs, you know, by 10% uh, 20 years from now, by a sort of if we kind of learned what we don't now know but need to learn. Well, you know, 10% of trillions of dollars uh, swamps. Uh, what the government in our current political environment can do. Uh, so this needs to be really thought clearly about. Uh, you know, when you have companies uh, like Apple and uh, Google, and Microsoft, uh, Facebook, uh, they, uh, Amazon, uh, <coughs> any of them uh, uh, could, uh, could mount a privatization effort uh, either directly within their companies or by spin-offs or just by investment uh, that uh, would make Solera, you know, look like it was a kind of a little circus sideshow uh, because uh, the, uh, this, is, uh, this is the real deal. And uh, I don't believe that, uh, that uh, this issue has uh, been adequately uh, addressed in the, uh, you know, there are a lot of reasons for that, but I, Anyway, this is my cause. Wes? Yeah, I was struck uh, early, the first <coughs> half of the lecture, you talked uh, several points about how it was the quality of the input data more than the sophistication or the power of the analytic algorithms, I think, yes. the point you made. Yeah. And it's, in, it's interesting, because now when I'm thinking about PMI and other sort of uh, private efforts to be gathering data and crowdsourcing data and all mm -hmm. these things, the underlying hypothesis seems to be that the quality and the heterogeneity yeah. and the inconsistency of the data, yeah. not a problem because we're going to have such yeah. powerful algorithms, it'll all come yeah. out in the end. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. I mean, it's a generalization of the kind of thing I was saying in a very small theater to a much bigger, comp more complicated problem, but I, I, no, I agree. I, I think that, that uh, <laughs> big data, uh, per se, is, uh, has already been a disappointment and will become a progressively bigger disappointment as it becomes bigger. <laughs> the, uh, you, need, uh, you need a model uh, for what, uh, what you're doing and, uh, and you need uh, input data that, uh, are, that are the best possible. We're going to have huge difficulties getting adequate phenotypic data you know, straight out of the Mayo Clinic. Uh, you know, especially if we want to merge it with data from the clinical center here. You know, this is a this is a very hard problem, and the notion that people wearing you know some Google Watch around or something are going to you know be reporting you know useful phenotypic data is non nonsense. The uh, we need uh, good quality data, and uh, you know if we're talking about decades and decades and decades, you know there's a saying that uh, you know that well you know. The reason everybody's genome should get sequenced is it only have to be sequenced once. Well, that's a, is a, and then you know, follow through them, follow through the lifetime with them. I mean, this, this statement is absurd. The, uh, you know, I had my genome sequenced about three years ago, uh, 30x coverage, and so forth. Just, you know, I hang out in the circles. Didn't cost me anything, and uh, <laughs> and I didn't learn anything from it. Uh, <laughs> but if I decided next year. Uh, to get seriously engaged in analyzing my genome sequence, I just had to have it done, done again. Because if the new sequence were even marginally better uh, than the one I had three years ago, and it would actually be quite a bit better, uh, it wouldn't be worth working with those old data. 
and uh, you know, people, to the extent that genomics is going to uh, you know, really Im impact medicine, uh, that's not the right way of looking at it. It's, uh, you know, how many times have you had your blood, you know, uh, uh, lipid profiles done and so forth? It's going to be like that. Uh, and that's not where the costs are going to be. The, uh, uh, where, uh, the costs are uh, <coughs> going to be elsewhere. The, I mean, this is another example, again, a, a, a generalization of kind of the, my lesson is uh, if there were ever a situation in which there's no single rate limiting problem, uh, you know, the whole precision medicine pipeline is, is one. I mean, you can just list and list and list problems that need to be overcome. And uh, any one of those problems could disappear with a magic wand without having much effect on the whole project. And uh, so that's uh, hard. Uh, that's why I've identified the, uh, you know, the kind of the informed consent privacy issue. If, if, there's, if there's a rate limiting factor, it's the way we handle that. Uh, I believe that some, of, some large cohorts that, uh, you know, that are being built around the world are going to have to simply be discarded outright uh, because uh, you know, they didn't get that right. And uh, standards change, uh, opinions change, and uh, it'll be easier to start over again, a new informed consent form, and then start over again again. And what distresses me is how little study, in particular, how few pilot studies are being done in this area. You know, we need to try a lot of different things. They're, none of them is going to work perfectly, but there are better ways and there are worse ways. The way we're doing it right now is the worst way. Maybe not the worst, but a worse. Yes? Just wanted to hear your opinion on how important you thought your local academic environments were in, in forming your opinions and kind of growing as a scientist. And was it really kind of the department level, or was it kind of a few key individuals that were local that helped you? Oh, it's a kind of cultural question. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I, I mean, obviously, our environments are, are everything. You know, we. Uh, I, uh, I take departmental level uh, environments very seriously. <coughs> Obviously, research groups have their own culture, and that's very important. You know, all these things are important. Key individuals are important. But uh, in the, I have consistently, over my whole career, been a strong supporter of strong departments in universities. I don't care how siloed they are. I think this is, uh, I don't like. Uh, you know, sort of vague departmental boundaries. Everyone has an appointment seven places and lab space here and lab space there. I'd, uh, you know, I, uh, let, let, you know, let departments uh, work out their own way of, let members of departments work out their own ways of interacting with uh, people with other specialties and so forth. Anyway, I, 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 I've always been a strong supporter of departments and uh, now, you know, I used to joke uh, with uh, people, uh, you know, there was a period when I got a lot of job offers from academia and from uh, the private sector and uh, they, uh, you know, they always wanted me to go and work in some industrial park, you know, where they would build, you know, some vast you know, space for me. And I said, look, if I, if I wanted to work in an industrial park, you know, uh, I would have uh, done that a long time ago and I'd be wealthier than I am now. But, uh, <laughs> You know, I like I like uh, I like academic environments, and I think departments are really critical. Uh, just and they you know they shouldn't be huge; got to be big enough to have some diversity. But uh, and, uh, and I'm quite skeptical of interdisciplinary programs. They, uh, uh, they, yeah, I've been in a lot of them. Um, they're just you know thought of as an interdisciplinary person at some point in at Seattle as, as a professor of medicine and. Uh, genome sciences and genetics, and I was an adjunct professor of computer science, despite some of the kinds of comments I made. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, you know, that was all just on paper, really. I uh, you know, was always a creature of one department. That's where I had my labs. That's where I spent my time. And, uh, and, and then I had all these other interactions, but uh, so did other people in the department. I, I don't know. The environment's extremely important. Yeah. Okay, keeping an eye on the clock, I think we should wrap it up. But thank you, Maynard, as expected. Thank you. Thank you.